the reason why we go screaming, playing our instruments and singing at certain junctures. The reason why we do this is so that we chase bad spirits from our community because we are going into the new year. And that time my eight year old mind was imagining uh, things like Scooby-Doo being, being a reality. So I, I actually got curious that particular time, moment and we were with my siblings at home. So we had to, bling, to plead with my mother to allow us to, us to stay a little bit longer so that we could experience this thing of running around between 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. And true to it, we went. Fortunately, I didn't see any Scooby-Doo ghosts. So it was just running <laughs> and singing. Actually, it was more fun than scary. So yes, that's, so we, we learn both. We get to learn both. So to this level, I know Western, Western stuff from my education system. And I also understand my own cultural practices issues. And there's also, having studied African music, I've learned generally about the music and cultures of Africa. Have things changed in this education system since you know you were young? Like, is there more culture and such in the classroom? Mm, currently, no. That is that is not the case. Unfortunately, there's a challenge here in Kenya. Um, I have observed both within my orchestral experience uh, area and in the education system. I think colonization has had an, a certain psychological impact on we Africans. And there's a way we, we, we unconsciously inherit certain practices, certain beliefs, because of the people who originally received um, the colonial impact. So we find that we are still trying to copy the West, the way they teach, the way they, they, the way they do, any, the way they go about life, and even in the education system. So we are still copying them. And right now, actually, as we speak, there's this, personally, I went through something called the 844 system. That, one, that means you go through eight years of primary school, four years of secondary school, then four years of undergraduate school. Then from there, it's optional to go to master's or PhD. But eight, the 844 is actually compulsory. That's, that's when you are considered that you've gone through the education system. But right now, we are taking in a different system. It's, we are inheriting something called the competency curriculum, CBC, com competency-based curriculum. And we've had, myself, I've had and the critics of the curriculum here are saying that that curriculum is not really the best for, for our Kenyan children. There's a possibility that it will make them not be able to think critically. It has issues, basically. So we are still coping the West. And I think this particular curriculum I had, it was rejected in the US or something of that sort. But we are just taking it and we are coping. So things haven't changed much. And if I may add something, I think there's a need for us to, to heal through, to heal from colonialism impact and, and all that so that we, we are thinking for, we are thinking while using our own knowledges. Can I ask Daniel or Chrisana to jump in? Um, so my first question, I guess, would be just just tell me a little bit about the history of Kenya. So I was reading that it was. Do you want to introduce yourself, Daniel? Oh, hi. Hi. Yes. Hi, my name is Daniel Roberts. I am a music student here at the University of Trinidad and Tobago's APA, um, composition major. And yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Um, so we were just... Um, we'll, going off of what Jessica was kind of, of talking about. What I want to know before we get into everything is if you could tell me a little bit about the, the colonization history of Kenya. I believe it was under British rule at one point. Were there any other rulers um, per se? We were under the British rule, that's correct. So uh, before the colo colonizers came per se, we had the missionaries coming and the missionaries' uh, main goal was to, in fact, they are the ones who really, um, what is, they, 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 they initiated the cultural and alienation process because they came introducing uh, the gospel to us. And in this gospel, um, the, the, uh, the Africans are told that 
there's God, you have to believe in God, <clears throat> you need to pray certain ways. And as far as mu music is concerned, they were introduced to certain hymns. So they had to sing the hymns of God. And now, as missionaries were doing this, colonialists crept in. Now colonialists came to, to reinforce the, 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 the missionaries work, but heavily from a political perspective. So that's when you started seeing now people being displaced from their lands and they were bringing in other crops and, and introducing them to the land. And as we speak, one of the decolonization movements that, I, that is going on here is about getting back the crops that were being grown in, uh, in the eastern part of this country because the, the people involved in these projects are saying that the crops that were brought somewhat destroyed the soil. And so they are trying to help the land heal, even as the humans, we ourselves are trying to heal. So there's that aspect of, of also helping the land retain its original state. Um, so yeah, so as you're talking about the de decolonization movement in Kenya, um, do they still have any type of colonized traits in, in the school system? Colonized, by colonized traits, you mean the way students are, are handled, right? Um, well, yeah, it could be anything. So for example, in Tr Trinidad, we still, we still wear uniforms, which is a heavily British thing. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any, any sort of thing like that still occurring in the Kenya? Do you want to share just a few of the things that we discussed? Uh, so just want, we did some group work where students kind of uh, shared different experiences of what they felt were holdovers from, from uh, English colonization. Do you want to share some of those here and we could compare? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I first said was the uniforms. And I was telling, I was telling the class the other day that um, it really doesn't make sense the type of uniforms that we wear because sometimes we have to wear like long shirts and long pants and we're in a tropical country. So it's applicable, yes, to an English climate, but not necessarily a tropical climate. So it's one of those things that I feel very, very emotional about. Um, another thing that we've retained would be the, the system. As you said, you guys have the, it's the, the 844. As you said, well, um, we do seven for, for primary school and then either five or seven for secondary school and then you go off to university. Um, yeah, they're also, hmm, I'm trying to remember what were some of the other points. Corporal punishment. Said. Go ahead. Corporal I'll punishment, corporal. right. So corporal punishment was outlawed in 2012 uh, in Trinidad. Is it still legal in, in Kenya? Yes. Yes, and now just to answer the whole of that question, we still have traits of colonization in our system. In fact, going back to when I was in primary school, I remember we never quite used to learn in the school. We never used to learn about our music per se. If it's there, it's maybe like 10% of the curriculum. So the other, re the rest, if you have music in your school, that is, and music is an expensive subject here in Kenya. So if you happen to have music in your school, so you are basically heavily focusing on the scales of the, of, of the Western kind. And yet here in Africa, we have our gap scale, the chasmatonic scale. You are focusing on their theory. So yes, we, we still have those to date. And I'm, I'm specifically referring to our public schools, the, Kenyan schools that are, that are teaching the Kenyan curriculum, they are still uh, going, we have uniforms, just as you say. And another thing about the colonial system is the militarization of everything. It's every, everywhere. You have to, the way you, you, you are forced to obey something and to live a straight life, that's, that's partly colonial. Because when you go to the village, life is relaxed. And there's a reason why life goes on the way it does. So, yeah. Anything further you want to ask Daniel or should we go to Chrisana? Um, well, I did want to ask about that second question. Um, now, it is not, it is not um, very common still, but at a point, especially like right after our decolonization period in Toronto, Tobago, there was a lot of uh, um, racial segregation in, in the schools. Now, this is, this is rare, but it can still happen. 
um, is there any type of racial segregation or segregation of any kind that happens in the Kenyan schools? Yes, segregation is actually embedded in our system. One of the reasons why cities like Nairobi exist is to reinforce the issue of segregation. So originally Nairobi was formed, it was, it, Nairobi is actually a, a colonial uh, town. It was created out of colonialism. It was formed so that people could come from the villages to come and provide labor within Nairobi for the British uh, people. So right now, if you come here in Nairobi, when you come here, you will see the way people live. There are areas where you can just tell that these people don't really have a home here in Nairobi. So they stay in areas like slums, and they are the ones who go to work for people who stay in, in the upper upper class areas. So that's segregation on itself. Within the education system, now the, the people of the Nairobi workers go to public schools in general, and these public schools are not really well looked after. So if you get into the classroom, you see the conditions are not so good. And so the other, the other, the, the upper class people go to mostly international schools or private schools. And the issue of segregation affects the young learners to the point that you find the government, you know, our government is still impacted by, we are still obeying the colonialists. So the government has been snatching land, like they're playing fields, they, 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 they just de destroy a section of the public schools which are attended by the children of the workers of Nairobi. So there's still segregation. Would you, would you see similarities there, Daniel? Um, yeah, yes, definitely. Because um, especially we have those 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 private and international schools. Um, in fact, I, I teach at one at, at an international school, and you can clearly see that is it is only for the upper class students. It's really for only those, and they tend to get you know um, a very high level of education there. So I I can see I can see some similarities there. Hi, good morning. I'm Susano. Hi, Chrisanna. Yes. Can you speak up just a little bit, or, or I'm going to go back to your. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, I'm just looking for you. Okay. Me too. Um, <laughs> Where are you? I'm not sure we're seeing you. <laughs> I'm in a colorful issues. Okay, can you, can you speak a little closer to your microphone? I'll tell you what, I'm gonna stop sharing, which is gonna okay. happen in a moment. And then we're gonna look for you. There she is. Chrisanna Mitchell, we're looking for. Go ahead, Chrisanna. Okay, hi, good morning. Hi, hi. so I'm all a percussion students at UCT. Um, I wanted to know, going back to the marimba, is it your typical three to four octave marimba? Or I saw a picture of you. Um, I'm not sure if that is the marimba. It's like a really small wooden instrument. Yes. Is that the marimba you play? Yes, as well? that that is that is my marimba, and that marimba is is not the orchestral kind. It was made from the Mijikenda scale. The Mijikenda are found at the coastal part of this country, Kenya. So the scale specifically is described as chasmatonic, chasmatonic, but my description of that scale is heavily influenced by my Western education. <laughs> so as an African musician, and I'm conscious about that, as an African musician, I'd call it the Kiringongo scale. I don't have to give it the chasmatonic or, or that kind of scale. I just call it the Kiringongo scale. I hope we meet one day so that you hear the sound. <laughs> yes, I hope so too. Um, when her quarters open, we will invite her. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> um, but in the orchestra, do you get to play like traditional instruments at times, depending on the um, like what music you all play? Do you ever get to incorporate that 
into your performances? When I was a member of the National Youth Orchestra of Kenya, we used to do that. So I, I was the marimba player. I was an orchestral percussionist. I was learning about orchestral percussion, performing on orchestral percussion. But we used to have um, one, one or two pieces at the end of the concert so that people could dance. And it was really, it was fun. And two of my friends also used to play the, the Kenyan flute, which is called Chivoti. So this, that Chivoti is found also amongst the Mijikenda. And another lady used to play the Obokano. The Obokano, you'll compare it to the harp. Okay. But it's a Kenyan one. It has its own different, slight differences. Okay. Um, in terms of the education system, where is the balance point in deciding how much of each culture is taught at the schools? Knowing that you all had, um, say, British influence as well, as well as Trinidad and Tobago. So, like, where's the balance point? Because I know in Trinidad, we learn a lot about the European history and... We do learn about our own history here, but it's not as much. So you'll find many young people not always knowing what um, happened in the past to relate it to what's going on presently in the country. Wow, that, that's a really deep question. Um, the balance point, this, yes. This uh, is, from my view, I think it's heavily dependent on the politics of education because uh, as i mentioned before we are st our leaders are still coping what's going on in the west so if they see that teaching piano is better in school teaching piano in school is better than teaching a marimba even that small marimba that you saw mm -hmm. then um, there we've obviously chosen the western culture over our own African. And um, at the moment, I don't see where the balance point lies. I'm just not quite impressed by the way we still keep imitating what the West are doing. And majority of the times we actually have challenges even getting those resources themselves because they are too expensive. So we overlook our own resource persons in the village instead of employing them and requesting them to make 50 marimbas for a class, we really try to save up like 5 million Kenyan shillings to buy one single piano. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, so I'm, I'm not seeing where the, the, whether there is a balance yet. We have a lot of work to do and this is, this is where the decolonization, decolonization issue should help us. But Chrisanna, do you want to tell uh, uh, Dorothy a little bit about the steel pan movement? Okay, well, um, the steel pan, it started off um, through the Tambu Bamboo, I believe it was. I'm not really into pan as much. We, we can ask the panists to join yeah. in a little bit. But what I, what I Hi, good morning. Hi. <laughs> And Jesse, I'm gonna I, I, I I'm gonna let Chris on a like questions if you can. So what I really what I wanted you to talk about was uh, access to steel pens in school. Oh well, um, for me, the school I attended, um, my primary school, I was introduced to pan at a very young age, from age five all the way up to secondary school. And my secondary school was one of the first all girls secondary schools to participate in junior panorama as well. And after years of using steel pans from other bands, we were fortunate enough um, three years ago, I believe, yeah, to um, have access to our own steel pans. So we'd be, we were able to purchase our own. So um, it's very heavy. Steel pan is very heavy in schools now, I should say. Yeah, as not really much other um, instruments. The, in the interesting thing to me in terms of the, the marimba and the steel pan and the piano 
that they have in common is that your theory is laid out. You can see a scale, you can see a half step, you can see, uh, and so they would be equally useful uh, in the, uh, as, a, as a beginning instrument uh, in terms of then opening up to, to other opportunities as well as a, as a great instrument of, in and of itself. But as, as Dorothy says, the marimba and the steel pen are so much cheaper mm. than, than buying pianos and much easier to maintain. And so in terms of making music accessible for a large number of students, I would choose the marimba and the steel pen any day. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I so um, Expense-wise, because pans are pretty expensive now. In, if it is like certain schools want to purchase it. So my school was um, not fully government. So we're able to do things on our own to acquire those instruments. But um, when you look at like quality of pans, our pans compared to fully government pans is not always the best, but it's still useful and it still um, introduces students to music and get them interested in it for the future. Hmm. I think it's gotcha. really interesting, like Pan, as an, that example of how we've begun our decolonization process. Because going to school in primary school, there was still Pan in my school as well. And I, I don't know how common that was. Well, I think it was common, like all schools that had Pan. And the other thing we used to learn was recorder, but I don't figure that was local. That was that's a form of a cheap sort of instrument, I imagine. Uh, so that was our sort of experience with that. Um, I wanted to jump back in just relating to my question, because um, you touched on it last time, and it was <laughs> along the lines of um, what, what, what were the other barriers that you ex did you experience in trying to decolonize the classroom? Mm. Mm. <clears throat> barriers in colonization, decolonization of education. Yes. Wow. <laughs> there is. Um, <sighs> it's heavily a political issue because when you find that the students are expressing certain interests, remember they are receiving education from their grandmothers in the form of traditional narratives. So if you find that they, they see the instruments in the village, but they go to school and they are playing, they, are, they have a drum kit, those who have it. Um, it's a barrier in itself. So you find the child is growing up um, with this, this, this enforced acquisition of knowledge of Western music stuff. And so they fail to learn, because most of the time they're in school, the Western education system. So they fail to learn skills during their formative years of education, the skills of, of their, their own indigenous communities, uh, knowledges. Another issue regarding <coughs> the barriers of decolonization of the, uh, the education system is, um, I'd say, the, 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 the issue of the government just not acknowledging that it's not really necessary to have uh, policing in schools because I think it tends to, to to dwarf the, the, the development of a human being. So I'm sure there are better ways of dealing with human beings uh, uh, other than, pan okay, our, here they say it was banned, but teachers still do it uh, quietly. So there are better ways of dealing with the individual uh, other than punishing them or putting rigid, rigid school rules and I think I, I can easily relate that to the way colonialists were dealing with Africans in their communities when they were displacing them from their lands. So, so it's, it, it's, it, it, it is a barrier that we still experience because decolonization is an ongoing thing. It's, it's a really, it's still ongoing, yeah. And I, I, can I jump in just for a second, you guys? I, I think it's such an interesting comment because uh, um, I had a personal experience in my, my early uh, teaching in Trinidad where I had access to 
two very different types of school systems and one group of children that really had uh, my uh, my experience of it was that they they would only answer if if asked directly and if they felt like they had whatever they thought was the right answer and i had another group of students who had really been encouraged to to know that their own opinions mattered and uh, and it was a much noisier much harder to handle group uh, but i loved it because uh, what we the their uh, their opinions of their themselves seemed to me to come across as if they had been invited that they mattered and that their opinion mattered um, and so I was very curious it, it, uh, I think if you're if you're coming at it from a um, from that uh, corporal punishment uh, you know be, speak only when spoken to yes it's easier to manage the classroom but what's the outcome exactly. does anybody learn anything <laughs> Not, not really. There's, there's a, a negative inf effect on the mind of the individual, and unfortunately, sometimes students are hurt physically. So, it's, it's not quite, it's not quite, quite uh, advisable to continue with that corporal punishment issue. So, so we have to find ways to creative and creatively engage our students and uh, invite opinions uh, and come up with a mutual respect. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about that with safety in the classroom and um, some interesting ideas. I'm going to jump back out now and let you guys take over. I, I just wanted to add what you said, Caitlin, that was interesting because like I've experienced, you know, both sides and it reminds me how much decolonization starts in the mind because I was grew up in a school where like it was taught that, you know, you spoke only when you're spoken to. And it was just through like years of having to kind of unlearn that, and especially going to university, having to sort of now teach myself that, okay, what I have to say matters. And, you know, so it's like, it would be so great if you could just sort of cut that out of the process and just empower youths from, from the get-go, you know, but these discussions always help to further that the importance of this kind of topic, you know. Um, so I wonder if this might be a good good segue into looking at some ideas for the future. So two areas you guys seem to really focus on were history and technology. Yeah, I think so. Christana, do you want to start? Yeah, um, going back to the education system, I really feel as though more should be taught about our history and even the history of the Caribbean as well. So everybody will know how we are all connected and then bring it into the wider world and see how they impacted on us. But to keep it as the wider world and base everything off of them, um, the whole structure of the education system, it doesn't do all good for us. We need to learn more about where we come from, have know our roots very well first, and then know the outside world as well. And then um, use technology because we are in the 21st century. We, we right? just focus on history first, Chrisanna? Okay. Well, Jessica could go now, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, in my experience, like, so the history of Trinidad was such that you know, we were colonized by the British, by the French, by the Spanish. And so we often just get taught that small subject of history and we only get taught up as far as slavery. So we just figure like, you know, in our minds, our life is in here, it starts with slavery. And so that keeps that in our mind. I would love to teach, have history taught in a way that it was beyond that, different accomplishments that our society has, has done. Um, uh, all our different cultures in a different way and before the like, stories about before they got to Trinidad and include celebrating some of our like indigenous heroes so, so sort of celebrating um, our own heroes and also framing what Europeans have done to us in a way that we recognize yes it impacted us but there is still better for our future. Mm. I'm just going off of what Jessica is saying uh, I think I think the history just needs to be um, updated 
because coming from school, so I did history for um, CSEC, and you learn a lot about, as Jessica said, you learn a lot about slavery. And then after slavery, it just kind of stops. And that's really where our school system is. You learn about slavery up to like, let me say, um, where it finished, then you get the indentureship. So, but then after that, it stops. And from that time to now, we have so many accomplishments. We don't even talk about the PAN. The PAN is one of the biggest accomplishments of Trinidad and Tobago, and it is not taught. The history of the PAN is not taught in schools. So I think that definitely needs to be updated. Uh, even some of our movements and the power black movements and things like that that have happened, you know, so many years later, it's like, what, this happened? So we've had also, like, great moments of, like, you know, protests that have led change in Trinidad that we don't even know about. So then if we knew about that, what, that would also empower us to be more empowered citizens to protest and things like that. So um, it's, yeah, it's about also the history after. And to add to what Prisanna said about the Caribbean, I have found that there is a great divide between us, even though we have a, we have a shared culture and, and, and history, and we really don't know much about each other, and we don't end up not liking each other when we get older. So that already kind of promotes another division within our region. But so let me just ask a question, and uh, uh, how does it make you feel as a student if all you're studying is about uh, oppression? and not celebrating achievement. You're all muted. <laughs> I don't know who wanted to take and Daniel looks like he's done. Um, so it kind of, it kind of, it kind of burdens you as a student um, because yes, you're teaching it, but because of all this oppression, that's all you have in your mind that we are constantly being oppressed, right through, right through, right through. Um, and I don't, I don't think it really helps us to create our own, our own image of our, of, of our, of ourselves as a people. We, we don't see the greatness that we are. I wanted to add, like, I don't think I was aware of it. You know, this, that's how sneaky it is. You're not conscious of it, how it affects you. So I could just remember being a child and just feeling, you know, like maybe not that you're not, like, you know, don't matter, you know? So um, then again, that also stifles your creativity because then you feel you have to match a particular standard that isn't you, you know, you want to match whatever the West has taught you that is great or your mind is just sort of focused there as opposed to like what's around you and, and it disconnects you from yourself, I would say, so. May I mention something? Yes, I'm, I'm actually, I'm touched by the stories that you're sharing because to you guys, like it's decolonization is, is a broader journey because you are displaced and then you are in these mixed cultures and, and you really <clears throat> don't know, it's like you really don't know who you are. Sometimes you know who you, you feel like you know who you are, and then at other times the environment reminds you that you do not know who you are, right? Is that the case? So, yeah, I I just wanted to mention that. So, I think I I, I also wanted to say there's something that there's a, a a certain bird that it's it's fictional. It's called the Sankofa bird, and it's when you look at its picture can just google it you'll see that it has turned its head like it's looking on its back so the the issue of decolonization is about looking back and and looking and checking for what what you left behind and you pick it and you move with it and for me personally i believe that it's a journey that we have to take with grace because as i think jessica you mentioned that there are things that were done and we cannot undo them some of those, most of those things harmed us and we can't just erase our histories. In fact, I think it's important that we acknowledge them, that they happened and our ancestors were injured in certain ways. So even as we are trying to decolonize, I, I'd encourage people to do it with grace and just embrace what comes and, and keep, keep you, don't, you can't give up trying to know yourself. I believe it's a journey that will be achieved one day. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, let me want to ask the questions in the comments. Are we like supposed to ask them or are you? I'm going to just go to the next screen real quick and then uh, um, we've still got plenty of time for, for questions from the chat room. So we just uh, so so they uh, it seemed to me that the students had focused really on in terms of uh, views for the the 21st century approach. Um, they focused on history and technology. Okay, so uh, since mine is up there first, I'll go. Um, some of my other ideas that I want to incorporate in a 21st century classroom would be uh, like gamification and. and Edutain edutainment, so entertainment in the classroom, because I remember like the concept of games and so forth, which is not appropriate for class. But what I do right now is like I work in the animation and game space, and I've learned so much through entertainment. So I really strongly believe in you know class should be fun, um, and you learn best when you're enjoying yourself. So I definitely believe in like creating content and encouraging students to create content so that they can see themselves within that space. It empowers you. Because I've always been into media, but growing up, you know, you don't see people that look like you. So you feel, okay, that's not, I'm not supposed to be part of that, you know. And so giving that empowerment to young people is definitely something for 21st century, in my, in my view. And then Daniel, I think yours was the second one. Yeah, um, well, first I wanted to ask a question, Dorothy, which is that how, how has teaching been going for you with, within the pandemic? I know everybody's made the switch to online. Um, I'm not sure how it is like in Kenya. Um, if, if, if you wouldn't mind telling me about that. Here in Kenya, uh, in schools, uh, schools, we basically, the day they reported the first case, the schools were closed immediately. <laughs> It was, the, it was just the first thing, like Africans value life. So knowing what had been going on throughout the, the world, that's the first thing that was done. So school and public schools have specifically had a challenge uh, implementing online teaching because they, we don't have resources. Myself in my university, I've, I've, I am yet to, I was just about to defend my thesis. I have not heard from them since the institutions were closed because we don't have that system. But you find individual teachers, so like myself, I link up with people who are interested ab about the marimba, then I teach them. Because I, if that is, if they have, if they have the resources online, they, can, they have a laptop or a phone, then we can work together up to a certain extent. Those who are interested, I, I guide them towards getting the instrument for themselves, and they, this is the way we work. So, here, education is actually basically a bit stagnant due to the COVID pandemic. The, the president and the, the ministers have always been insisting that we have to preserve the lives of our children and the youth. It's such a hard, hard, uh, give me two secs. Uh, I think that's such a hard, I, I, I personally am grateful not to be in leadership right now, to have to decide between the, the health of the, the nation and the health of the economy because they're so, they're so intertwined and it shouldn't be a political issue. Um, but, but that's such a hard cocktail. What were you gonna say, Daniel? No, I was just gonna say that I, I totally understand um, with that. Well, of course we had, when our first case hit, we had that, that beginning challenge, um, it was at the it was at the middle of the, of the second school term into the third school term for the primary and secondary schools. And then well, in the middle of the second semester for universities. And that is when we got hit hard. And that is when we were forced to jump into this online thing. And exactly as you said, in fact, it's still affecting some students. Some students don't have the resources. And so it's a little hard. And so I think for, you know, moving forward, we need to find ways of hopefully when this pandemic <laughs> Um, you know, it's over, if it's ever over. And um, we need to find ways of blending, blending the two of online learning um, as well as in person, because it really showed us how, how anything can happen at any moment, snap of a finger, the whole world change. And I think, I mean, I'm not saying now, you know, we, we need to be ready for everything because you can never always be ready. But 
you know, we could put, we could try to implement certain things, um, try to give as much students, as much resources as possible, or try to make it as, as easier to attain these resources so that we would be able to teach whether it is online or in person. But then also, if I may add, if I may add, there's, I'd say this education that has been going on, just the traditional kind, the ones that go on in the village, like this day I saw in the news, the, some students were being taught how to do uh, cattle keeping. They were out there the whole day. Now you see that that actually is another thing that indicates social segregation. So you find their age mates in private schools going on with online learning. Then they are in the field looking after cattle, but they are still learning anyway. They are, they are pretty much still learning, just that it's not the formal accepted way. The only way it's going to get addressed is if there's internet for everybody and all students are given access to a device. But then you have to, if, there, if both parents need to, to work or it's a single person uh, family, what happens if students are at home uh, unattended? How is their learning happening? It's a big, big problem that we need uh, artists to, to help solve. <laughs> I wonder if this would be a, a moment then to take some some questions from students. So Arminda, Arminda had thank you, uh, Jessica, Chrisana, and Daniel so much. Um, I think Arminda had the first question. Arminda, do you want to unmute your mic, or would you like me to read your question? Are you there, Arminda? Well, I'll go ahead and ask her question, and then if she's uh, um, able to speak, that would be great. She asked. Sorry, um, yeah, there's a lot of noise on my side. There's like a thunderstorm going on right now, and it sounds crazy. So if you could read it, thanks. Okay, actually, it sounded fine, Arminda, if you wanted to, to talk. Maybe not. Okay, so she asked, How do you think we can turn attention away? from the mindset of learning to pass the class and start teaching students a well-rounded way in order to become complete and productive members of society? Great question right there. Um, I think that that heavily depends on the current generation of the youth. So first of all, we need to acknowledge that knowledge is not that just what you get uh, because you're working towards a certificate. When you wake up in the morning, there's knowledge that you can get from your neighbor. That is, that is still something, that's knowledge. And there's a possibility that that particular knowledge will give you the skill of interacting with people in the society. So it's really a mindset which I'd, I'd, I'd challenge anybody who is under perhaps 40, <laughs> to try and implement because we are the change makers. We are the ones who are supposed to, it's, it's a switch thing that you should just do in your mind. Beautiful. I, I, hope I've, I hope I've answered. Did you wanna ask anything further, Arminda? Um, and someone mentioned that um, the term that I used, productive member of society means different things to different people. Um, and that's true. I think we need to have a more holistic view of what that means. Like some people consider um, material wealth to mean that you've become a productive member of society. But I think that it should be a more um, holistic and unrounded view than just your um, material and capital um, worth. What are your add, thoughts on that? I, I, for me, I think being a productive member of the society means that you have certain values. So you, you could be having all the money, but if you do not have kindness, empathy, and those, those human values, then I, I wouldn't categorize you as a, as a productive member of the society because you, have, so you just have them and you are keeping them to yourselves. And you could share, you could feed a, a whole community during this COVID pandemic, 
but you you just have this the, the the resources but you're not you're not extending to the fellow human being next to you for me that's my view of being productive in the society yeah <laughs> um I think Jesse wanted to, Jesse Jagnerine wanted to share a little bit about steel pan history um, and some thoughts on that. Jesse, do you want to unmute your mic? Are you still there, Jesse? Yeah, good morning. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay, what's the time? Right. Um, okay. So, I, my I name is Jesse Jagnerine. I am a no. Uh, I am a third year, well, a fourth year student in UTT with a specialization in steel pan right now. And well, I just, um, it's just the history of the steel pan, right, Ms. Kaminga? And just, to, so you had said it's true we need to know our history, especially about the steel pan, but that you don't think that there's proper documentation, whereas in other instruments are properly recorded in documents. So how are we supposed to learn about the things that we don't really know? If you think ties into something yeah. that Dorothy's doing. Because um, what happened was that I had to do an assignment for somebody. Well, I did the certificate in pan and music literacy in 2016. And we had to do, um, the history of the steel band. And it was very surprising to me that some facts are like, um, he say, she say, because one minute they would say, okay, for example, Neville Jules. People would credit Neville Jules for actually putting the rubber on the steel band. But at the same time, he, he was not the only person it was, it was other groups of people. And then after that, at a certain point in time, when you go to the elders as well, they would always say, it's not only this person, it's that person or it's the other person. So it's not to say like how Ant Anthony is, um, if I remember clearly, Anthony Williams, who created the fourth and fifth span, or Mr. Bertie Marshall, who was accredited for the, um, for the double tenor, I believe, right? Some of these things, they're not properly documented to say that they are properly documented, even though they have documentaries about it. Sometimes the, the, the information is always subject to change because if you look at the timeline, there are specific things. So first we started off with Tambu Bamboo that was like in the late 1930s or 1940s. Then from well, it actually started with African drums, eh? because when it was, we had the African drums, that was when the Africans came to Trinidad, we were going through the slavery and everything with segregation and everything. After that point in time, they had banned all African drums, and that's when Tambu Bambu came in. They started to deal with anything that they could find, pots and pans, because at that point in time, they were, like, the, white slave, the white plantation owners thinking that, you know, it's some form of, of communication between all these Africans because at the point in time they, they, these people were coming from different parts of Africa it was just not only Zimbabwe it was also Kenya it was also um a lot a lot of other countries right so they think Jesse? that is some form of communication so they banned it yeah why don't we ask Dorothy if I, what did was there suppression of a uh, local instruments was that so so there was a, a a period of time where where african drums were were banned in trinidad and mm -hmm. one of the most interesting parts of of trinidadian history for me to learn was was how out of that oppression the the steel pen uh, evolved and it's the only as far as i know it's the only modern uh the uh, acoustic instrument to have been invented in the 21st century um, uh, but I'd be curious to know if there were, if, if similar things happened in Kenya. Um, suppression of, of, of musical instruments have happened con concurrently with the suppression of our traditional knowledges. So there's, there's a whole, a whole thing that is captured over there and it's not, it's, it's, you, you you can't quite dismiss the fact that it continues to happen so 
so yes it's it's there it happens it myself and people who do things like me the preservation who participate in preservation active preservation are the ones that really try to deal with this suppression so that we ensure that we can still express ourselves using our instruments and our languages because that way at least we get to deal with with it to the best of our abilities so it it it's something that continues to happen I think we have time for one more uh, student to speak. I, I wondered if Hayden Cornelius wanted to speak. Hayden, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Great. So uh, you had a couple of comments there. Morning. Morning, morning. I wanted to know. Right, I, I'm going back to my question. Yeah, I would like to know um, how music is used in Kenya as a form of protest or part of protest or as a part of the protest? Here, I've observed that artists have the freedom to create what they think. However, there have been cases whereby the artist has worked on their song, it has gone to the studio, now it, he has produced it and, it and we've had it. Then there have been cases whereby they've been arrested and they've been taken to, to court and accused of dealing of saying things against the government so there's freedom of using your <clears throat> your voice or your art even if it's painting whatever you want to do with your art you can use it but yes it's it's we are it's not like uganda whereby uh, it's i think that it's a bit harsh compared to here so yes we have the freedom to use music did i answer your question <laughs> um is there a particular style of music that's, that's used in, if you're going to say um, protest? No, there's no, you, there's rap, there's, there's hip hop, there's even the traditional music itself. We are songs that, that are protesting what people don't like. So there, there, isn't, there isn't a specific genre that has been seen to, to really specialize on protesting. But there's reggae, all, all those, And I have one last question. Is that okay, Caitlin? Of course. Um, I'm just curious. I don't know. So this is sort of, I guess, been bothering me from the beginning. Was, is, do you still have, um, let's say, colonialists? I don't know if that, what really that would, what that would look like. I'm assuming maybe white British or something like that, maybe French. I don't know. Who are still driving the economy in Kenya. And that's the reason why it's hard to pull out uh, or to bring about um, change or reform? Are they pr um, pushing the economy? And I just don't understand why it is it's so hard to come out of colonialism and colonial standards if you don't have that. Yeah, I'd say yes, we still have them here amongst ourselves. Oh, okay. Majority of the time, like let me give you an example of something just that happened that was said last week. There's a community called the Ma, M double A. So these people are pastoralists. So somebody said, and this, 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 I would say they are a colonialist, because they are. They say that the Ma are occupying their land, that they are overpopulating their land. You can imagine somebody coming to your home and saying that you and your family is overpopulating your house. <laughs> But they are saying that if these colonialists, if they come there, so usually they come in as tourists and then they, they change the land, they create their own things. If they come there, the overpopulation won't happen. This is something that was, was in the media last week. So mm. that is, that is, that is clear, a clear form of neocolonialism. And also we are definitely suspecting that China is trying to colonize us. Again, actually, they are building a military base as we speak. <laughs> yeah, they, they do not throw Africa right now. <laughs> yes. No, really, they are. Yes. They are. Yeah. So, they, so basically, then, those who are in power, the, I don't know, the presidents or whoever, they, these, the, the, the politicians, they know this, but they're allowing it for financial gain? Yes. Yes. Ah. yes. yes. And they really worship the colonialists, so. But for me, I also look at it with a, an eye of empathy because that's just it's, it shows that there's, 
there's trauma that is being handed down from generation to generation. They fear them, so they have to respect. They, it's not even respect. They fear them, so they do what they want them to do. For then, of course, they are paid. They are they are given money and all that. I think we're going to have to uh, let Dorothy go in a minute, but I just wanted to end with this quote, and I wondered if you could speak to it, Dorothy. You cannot enslave a mind that knows itself, that understands itself, that values itself. Wow, yes, this is quite powerful. I'd like to encourage the learners in this class to keep trying to find yourself try to understand yourself. I usually get touched when I li read literature about uh, instruments that were taken from Africa here and then they were taken to the Jamaica and, and all those countries. And now they've been uh, adopted there. So you just need to keep trying to, to express, I think expressing yourself, that's, that's, that's very important. Keep trying to express yourself regardless of the voices around you that tell you to keep quiet. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for coming. I wonder, I, um, I'm gonna introduce you to our, uh, um, through email to our steel pen instructors and to our percussion instructor. And I wonder if maybe you might, uh, Carissa, you can, uh, Carissa, Chrisana, you can help me. Perhaps we could invite Dorothy to a, a percussion masterclass. So I'm going to stop sharing because I want to take a picture if I'm allowed. Yes. I'm going to, let's see if I can get this. Uh, here we go. So if, if Dorothy speaks, then she'll be my big person on the screen. <laughs> okay. Uh... Am I visible? Yes, great. <laughs> Excellent, and I'm gonna take one with the whole class. Let's see if I can figure that out. Where's my, oh, I'm not sure I'm gonna manage that. It was so great to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> um I've been delighted to share with you students. I'm happy to hear your stories. I feel much more motivated to continue the process of rediscovering Africa and, and preserving it in an active sense. I hope to get in touch with you again in the future. Please feel free to share my email address, Kate. Okay, great. So somebody's just told me to go to gallery view and I'm having a, a technological issue. Uh, just a basically a brain fart. <laughs> Where am I looking? Where am I looking, guys? Top right, top right. Click on view, corner, click on view. Speaker view. And you see, if it's, if it's on gallery view, it, you'll see speaker view. If it's on speaker view, you'll see gallery view. And just click that. It seems to be working for me. Why not? You're looking for view. <laughs> the view on the top? I'm looking in the wrong place. There it is. OK. Ah, no, I got everybody. That's what I wanted. This is going to make me happy, you guys. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Okay, great. Smile. <laughs> One day we will have you to Trinidad, Dorothy. Thank you so much. I look forward to it. <laughs> everybody okay. will a 10-minute break. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Bye. The rest of you, we're going to take a... Bye. And then uh, we're going to just do a brief thing um, uh, on upcoming assignments. I hope that was enjoyable for you. Thank you very much, Jessica, Daniel, and Chrisana. That was just great. So it's 11.36, I'll see you at 11.45.